In this video, we're going to look into another example of how we can use the recursion and the looping strategy to implement iteration. In particular, we're going to look at the so-called Fibonacci numbers. There is a big difference in this video in comparison to the previous videos. So in this video, we will see that one of the two approaches is clearly better than the other. And in previous videos, this was not the case. In previous videos, both approaches basically were very readable code and also in terms of the speed of uh, the running program, uh, both uh, solutions were always efficient. But in this video, this will change now. So let's start a new file and let's call it Fibonacci. And uh, let's talk a bit about the so-called Fibonacci numbers. So what are Fibonacci numbers? So basically it goes like this. Given the first two Fibonacci numbers, which are defined to be zero and one, the next number is always, or it's simply the sum of the previous two. Okay, so let's um, do a sequence of Fibonacci numbers, starting with the first two numbers being zero and one. And zero and one, if we add them together, we get the third Fibonacci number, which will be one again. 1 plus 1 then gives me 2, and 1 plus 2 will give me 3. So we see that it seems like the numbers are rather small, but they have an ex they have a very uh, strong uh, growth actually built in. So let's continue. So 2 plus 3 will be 5, and 3 plus 5 will be 8, and 5 plus 8 will become 13, and so on. So these are, this is a sequence of Fibonacci numbers. Of course, the Fibonacci numbers, they go, technically speaking, into eternity. So uh, the sequence doesn't stop. And the numbers, as we see, they will become bigger and bigger at an increasing rate. So the growth behind that sequence is very high. Okay, so uh, let's think about how we can um, use this example of numbers to come up with two strategies uh, to solve the problem, to write um, a function that calculates the Fibonacci number. So in particular, the task is going to be given an index, let's call it i, calculate the corresponding Fibonacci number. Okay, so uh, let's uh, briefly review what indices are. So indices uh, in Python are just the numbers 0, 1, 2, and so on, all the natural numbers, but we start at 0 because Python is a zero-based language. Okay, so um, the, in other words, the index for the first number, the number 0, would also be the index 0. The second uh, index for the number 1 would also be the number 1, but then the index for the third uh, Fibonacci number, which is also 1, would then be 2, of course, okay? And uh, so that is a task uh, and that we want to solve. So given an index, let's calculate the corresponding Fibonacci number. Okay, so we can view the problem in two ways. First, we can, if we look at the example numbers here, we can view the problem from left to right, okay? But also we can view it from right to left. And this is kind of similar to the discussion um, of how we could view the factorial of a number also in two different ways. So let's do the following. I will now go ahead and um, draw a diagram because that is the easiest way to explain how Fibonacci numbers work. So let's go ahead and first write a couple of index numbers uh, on the paper here. So the first index is of course zero, then it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, and then let's put a couple of dots here. Okay, so the task is to define a function. So let's abbreviate this with simply fib as Fibonacci. And the function takes one argument and let's call it i, the index, and the task is to find the corresponding Fibonacci number, okay? So let's pretend that we don't know what the Fibonacci numbers really are, okay? We know the Fibonacci numbers, of course, for small numbers, but of course, for big numbers, if we want to calculate, let's say, the 1,000th Fibonacci number, then, of course, we don't know uh, what the number is, okay? So now, by definition, the first and the second Fibonacci numbers are given as zero and one, okay, by definition. Could, we could also change the definition, but this is just what mathematicians came up with. And now let's use an example. And the example is going to be, 
let's calculate the Fibonacci number for the index 5. Okay, let's do that by hand. So we want this number, we want to find this number. And now we are going to use a right to left approach first. Okay, so this is going to be the recursive approach. And uh, so now how does this work? Well, we know that whatever Fibonacci number will be here will be the sum of the previous two. Okay, so in other words, we can say Fibonacci of five, of index five, can be broken down into a sum of basically two numbers. And let's maybe make this a bit, a bit wider here. So the first one is going to be whatever Fibonacci number we get with the index four plus whatever Fibonacci number we get back with the index three. Okay, so whenever we have a node here, we basically add whatever numbers come back up here. Okay, simple summation. So now, if this here is the Fibonacci number with index five that we want to calculate, and we have broken down the problem into uh, finding the Fibonacci number with indexes three and four, how, how do we continue from here? Well, let's first go with the left-hand side here, Fibonacci of four, which is this number here. So how can we calculate this? Well, Fibonacci of four can be broken down further into the sum of Fibonacci number with the index three plus the Fibonacci number with the index two, of course, okay? So now we are basically here in those two spots here. So now, if you want to um, calculate the sum, what we need to find first is we need to determine whatever Fib of three and Fib of two is, okay? Otherwise we cannot sum it up. So until we uh, get some, uh, some numbers uh, from bottom up here, um, until then, we cannot do the summation yet. So we have to still wait in a way. So this is similar to how um, functions in a recursion have to wait in memory until another function call is done. Okay, this is basically what we are doing here by hand. So let's continue with the, uh, finding the Fibonacci number with index three. So how can this problem be broken down? Well, it is the sum of Fibonacci of two plus Fibonacci of one. So let's break this down. So this is Fibonacci um, of two plus Fibonacci of one. And let's continue our approach to go always left first. So um, in order to find Fibonacci with index two, which is this number here that we don't know, we can break down the problem into the sum of those two Fibonacci numbers. So this is going to be the sum of Fibonacci of one plus Fibonacci with index zero, okay? And now for the first time in this diagram, what we can do is, we can say, well, Fibonacci with index one and index zero by definition is known. So we can say here we get back one and here we get back zero. And now this node here can do the summation. So one plus zero gives me one. Now let's go ahead. The node where we are trying to calculate Fibonacci of three is the sum of Fibonacci of two plus Fibonacci of one. For Fibonacci of two, we just calculated the, re the result. And for Fibonacci of one, we basically know the result. Therefore, we can go ahead and simply add one plus one here, which gives me two, okay? So what do we know from this? Well, Fibonacci of two, we can basically uh, plug it in here. So to say, we could say Fibonacci of two would be one and Fibonacci of three would be two. But again, we are not going from left to right here. From left to right, this is kind of obvious, but we are going from right to left here. So now let's uh, continue here with Fibonacci of four. So finding this number here. And um, so to do so, we have to add Fibonacci of three plus Fibonacci of two. Now we have a problem. The left-hand side, we know the answer, but the right-hand side, we really don't, okay? So in other words, whenever I write um, in some number up here in orange, then this number is not really standing there. It's just something that we calculated on the fly from the bottom up here. So what we need to do here to calculate Fibonacci of two is we still need to break down the problem into Fibonacci of one plus Fibonacci of zero. And this of course is the same as all one and two. These are the base cases. So we have one and zero coming back. Fibonacci of two is the sum of that. So it is one plus zero, which is one. And now Fibonacci of four is two plus one, which gives me three, okay? So we could write the three here, but remember that all the numbers are right here in orange. They basically don't exist there. So this is just temporary. And so what we see is 
if you want to calculate Fibonacci of 5, and if you break down the problem into finding Fibonacci of 4 plus Fibonacci of 3, many, many calculations need to be done until we get to the bottom of the tree. This is a tree structure. And at the bottom of the tree, what we see is we find the so-called base cases, the two only numbers that are given by definition. And now, in order to finish uh, calculating Fibonacci of 5, we still have to calculate the, the, the right-hand side here. And the right-hand side goes like this. In order to find Fibonacci of 3 with index 3, this will be Fibonacci with index 2 plus Fibonacci with index 1. And Fibonacci with index 2 can be broken down into two further steps. Let's put them right here. This would be Fibonacci of 1 plus Fibonacci with index 0. Okay, And those nodes down here, they will give me back 1 and 0. I sum them up here, which gives me 1. And here, because by definition I get back 1, I get 1 plus 1, which gives me 2. And um, so then now next step would be to finalize the calculation. 3 plus, five, uh, 3 plus 2 gives me 5, of course. So let's write it here. Okay, so um, this would be the number 5. And we can also see it here going from left to right. 2 plus 3 would, of course, be 5. But again, um, we want to do the recursive approach first. So what can we already see here in the recursive approach? Well, we see that um, a lot of redundant work has to be done, right? So um, sometimes when we go down and let's say uh, we go to this Fibonacci of 2 here, well, Fibonacci of 2 here needed to be calculated from scratch, basically, because we don't know what these Fibonacci numbers are. They all need to be calculated. But on here, on the left-hand side, we already calculated Fibonacci of 2. So we are doing redundant work here, okay? So this Fibonacci of 2 here on the left-hand side, this is the first time we calculate Fibonacci of 2. And here we could look up the result, but we can't really because we, we need to learn a, um, a bit more about programming before we can do that. And on the right-hand side on the, on the tree here, we also see Fibonacci of 2 here. The same with Fibonacci of 3, which is here and here, right? Fibonacci of 2, which is here, here, and here. So we have lots of nodes where we calculate redundantly the same Fibonacci number given the same index. Okay, so for now, let's um, go back into um, Jupyter Lab, and now let's write a function that implements the, the approach that um, I just uh, draw you on the on the piece of paper. So let's define a function, and let's call it simply Fibonacci, and this function takes one parameter as its input, which is going to be i, an index number. And let's go ahead and write a nice doc string. So calculate the is Fibonacci number. Then um, args is of course i, which is an integer. And this is the index of the Fibonacci number to calculate and this function also returns something namely it returns let's write it down as is Fibonacci and this is also going to be an integer and now let's um, implement that using a recursion so in a recursion the base cases is basically what you see also in the example, which is given, okay? So let's go ahead and say, if i, the index of the Fibonacci number to calculate, is zero, then we know by definition of the problem that the answer is going to be zero. So we simply go ahead and say return zero. Now we're going to say elif i is equal to one. In that case, we go ahead and we say return one. So now note uh, or remember how elif work. So the condition after elif is only executed and checked if the condition in the if clause is false. So in other words, if the first condition is true, we hit the first clause, the first uh, return zero at the return statement. If, however, the first uh, condition is not true, then we check the second condition. And if the second condition is true, then we are going to return one. Okay. And these are both the base cases. So in this example, we actually see that there are problems in the world who have two base cases. So base case, let's call it number one, write it like this. And here we have base case number two. And now we are not yet done with the recursion. 
So for now, we still have to go ahead and write else. And now let's go ahead and now we have to do the recursive step. So let's say um, i is 5, just, just like in a drawing. So what do we need to do? Well, we have to do the following. We have to call, the function Fibonacci has to call itself two more times now. So first, it has to call it with i and subtract 1 from it. And then to this, we add whatever Fibonacci Fibonacci um, gets us the answer for i minus 2. Okay, so i minus 1 is the number that precedes whatever number we are looking for immediately. So there is basically the next number, the previous number. And Fibonacci of i minus 2 is the number that uh, precedes the previous number. So it's the number that is two numbers before the number we are looking for. And that is the result. So therefore, we are going to return that. And of course, as we saw in, the, in one of the previous videos, uh, what we can do is, because we know by now that whenever a function hits the return statement, the function is done, what we could do is we could remove the else clause again and unindent uh, this return statement, just like this. Okay, so this is the recursive case. And my claim is that this function is correct. So let's check that. So let's check it first by calling it with an argument of zero. So I want the first Fibonacci number with index zero. I get back zero by definition, that works. And let's go ahead and um, get the, the second Fibonacci number with index one, I get back one. And now let's try to get back the 13 here. The 13 has which index? Well, zero, one, two, three. Ah. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So index seven should give me back um, 13, so let's check. Index 7 gives me back 13, just as expected. Okay, so this function works. It solves the problem from right to left, so to say in a backwards fashion, kind of. And um, now comes something that is not so trivial, but something that we can already guess from the picture I just drew. So let's go ahead and look at some topic which is called um, efficiency of algorithms. In particular, here we are going to look into um, so-called exponential growth. So what do I mean by that? So as an example, let's go ahead and calculate the 25th Fibonacci number. So let's go ahead and say Fibonacci with index 24. Let's see how fast this function is. It's very fast, rather fast, I would say. Okay, so um, Let's go ahead and calculate the 37th Fibonacci number with index 36. So let's go ahead and use an index of 36. And now see what, what do you see here? You see that this cell here calculates some quite some time. So if I maybe execute all the Fibonacci calls here one more time, we see the first couple of ones are very fast. The one with index 24 is also rather fast. But with index 36, we see that Python needs some time. We see that with the star here, the star basically indicates that the Jupyter Lab is still calculating and it needs some time to find the answer. Okay, and let's see. Um, there is in Python, uh, in Jupyter Lab to be precise, there is something built in which is called the time it magic. And um, no space here. So what this time it does is it calculates or it measures how long uh, this cell is going to run. So if I copy paste maybe this up here, then instead of the result, I simply get back how, how much time the function needs. So if I call the function with 24 as the argument, it takes 16 milliseconds. And if I call it with 36, it takes 4.3 seconds. And let's do one step further. Let's call a function with an argument of 37. So I just add one to the input and let's see how long the function runs, roughly speaking. So we have to wait a bit and we have to wait longer than before. And um, let's wait more. And now it says seven. So roughly speaking, um, it should be twice the time the cell from the cell before. So in other words, adding one to i, so increasing the index i by one, should roughly double the, the amount of time, uh, the length in which um, the, the it takes for the function to finish, okay? 
So why is it not exactly twice as much? Well, because on my computer and also on your computer, um, other processes are running in the background. So uh, the Python process here does not always have 100% of the, of the processor. So therefore there is uh, some rounding errors, of course, but it's roughly twice the time, okay? And let's do one more example um, to finish showing the effect here. If I take 38, and then I should roughly have roughly 15, 16 seconds. So now we have to wait a bit more and we see that um, as long as this cell is being executed, we cannot do anything here really, right? We have to wait until the, the program finishes. It's a bit faster than expected, but still it's roughly uh, twice um, the, the, the time. So why is that? So the reason for that is because as we saw in the picture I, I, uh, I show, that whenever I call um, Fibonacci with some argument, I, let's say five here, I don't just call Fibonacci, so Fibonacci does not just call itself um, for as many times as the number suggests. So Fibonacci five does not lead to the Fibonacci number being called five times. But if I call Fibonacci with an index of five, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and I think I forgot this, so 15 more calls, okay? So in other words, if I want to calculate FIP of five, I have to, the function has to call itself 15 more times. And the reason why is because it does redundant work. So as we noted before, if you go from right to left, then we are doing redundant calculations. So calculations that we have actually done before for which we actually know the answer, okay? So that is true in this case. And we could also see, see that in the code because we can think of it like this. Whenever we call the Fibonacci function, the Fibonacci function sometimes in the recursive case calls itself two more times, okay? So in other words, for each call we make, the function calls itself two more times unless we are in the base case, right? So let's say the Fibonacci function is called once from us. It, it, it calls itself two more times and the two more times the function calls itself will lead to four more calls and the four more calls will lead to eight more calls. So in other words, for every round of calls, the number of function calls doubles, okay? And that is unfortunately an example of, um, let's uh, call it here, of exponential growth here. So when we talk about exp exponential growth, what we really talk about is what is the time unit it takes for the number of function calls to double? So for the number of, for the, the computational steps to double. And here it is for every, um, for let's say whenever we increase index by one, the number of function calls needed to calculate the solution for this problem just doubles, okay? And um, if you want, I suggest um, to, if you further want to dig into understanding re um, recursive calls using uh, with uh, exponential growth, I suggest you simply copy paste this function and you copy paste it into Python Tutor and you see also in Python Tutor how the function calls itself over and over again, even with the same arguments, okay? It makes the redundant calls. You can easily see that in Python Tutor as well. So that is bad. So we see, we see that this is bad because um, the function just takes forever. So the question now is, is there a better approach? And the answer is of course, yes, there is. And the better approach is um, let's write here, alternative looping approach. Okay, so now we are going to solve the same problem, the same Fibonacci problem, but we are not going to use a recursion, but we are going to use a looping approach, in particular a for loop. So um, why can we use a for loop here? So just remember that you can always use a for loop for any kind of iteration problem. If the number of iterations, the number of times where you need to make some repetition is predictable. So in other words, if I say, let's, let's see, I want to calculate the, third, the number 13, which is the Fibonacci number with index seven, as we saw, then we see that the first two numbers are given and then I need one iteration to calculate the one, I need a second iteration to calculate the two, a third iteration, a fourth iteration, a fifth iteration and a sixth iteration, okay? So we remember to calculate Fibonacci, uh, the Fibonacci number for index seven, I need five iterations, so five loops. So in other words, it is just the number of, um, the, the index minus two. This is the number of loops we need, of iterations through the for loop we need. And therefore um, we can use the for loop, it's predictable. 
So let's also um, do that here in a, a diagram so that in this diagram you also learn how we can um, solve the problem. So let's start with the first two numbers that are given as 0 and 1. So they are just given. Okay. So now what we do is, what we are going to do is, um, we are going to give two names, uh, two variables that reference these numbers. So at first, I will introduce a name A and a name B, and A and B are going to refer to 0 and 1. Okay, so let's go ahead. How can I uh, obtain the next Fibonacci number? Well, we know that the next Fibonacci number is 0 plus 1, so in other words, it is A plus B. Okay, so let's go ahead and add A plus B, and this gives me, of course, 1. And now what I need to do is, I need to go ahead and I now need to move, so to say, my variables. So what I now need to do in order to get to the next step, so the problem is um, find Fibonacci for i equals 7. So what we now do is we will remove our variables and we will basically move the variables one to the right. And now we will add a plus b again. And this is 1 plus 1, which will give us 2. And in the next step, we are going to move a and b one further to the right. And now they point to 1 and 2. And now we add a plus b, and this will give me 3. And then one more, so I'm not going to draw that everything here, but now if you go, go ahead, we need an, a further iteration, which gives me 5. And then we need one more iteration, which gives me 3 plus 5, which is 8. And then actually we need one more to get to iteration 7, to index 7, which is 5 plus 8, which gives me back 13. Okay, so this would be, uh, maybe I write it here, this would be index 7. And um, this here would be index 0, of course. So now let's see how we can um, use that idea that I just developed, that we have moving uh, variable names, how we can use that idea in Python code and uh, write a looping uh, version for that. So let's do that. So let's go ahead and inside the function, let's go ahead and set a to zero and let's set b to one. Okay. And now we have to write a for loop. So we are going to write for, and for now we don't know what we are looping over, so let's simply call it x. And let's go ahead and say for x in range. And in the range object, we now have to come up with some number so that the number of iterations that the for loop does is correct. So again, let me go to the example above. Let's say if I want to get to the 13, how many iterations do I need? Well, the 0 and 1 are given. I need 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six iterations, okay? So um, let's go further down and see how, how, we, how we can do that here. So for now, let's simply go ahead and uh, put the i in there, okay? We, we will have to change it. So the i is not yet correct, but for now, so that we get a working function, um, let's simply uh, write it as i. And now let's see what do we have to do in every iteration. Well, in every iteration, we now have to go ahead and simply add a plus b, okay? This gives us a sum, the sum of the next number, the next number. So how would we call that? Well, we could call it um, next number. This is one way. However, uh, because this variable, as we will see, is a temporary variable, we could also simply call it temp for a bit shorter. But you see from a conceptual point of view, it is just the next number. So now after we have calculated the next number, what we need to do is, we need to change a and b, as we just saw in the diagram I drew. So how do we do that? Well, we know that our new a, so the a was always uh, the number on the left-hand side. So the new a, so let's, let's uh, look at this here. So the new a is my old b, right? This is what happens uh, in the iteration. So in other words, my new a is simply my old b. Write it just like that in code. And what is my new b? Well, my new b is my next number. Okay, so my new b is nothing but temp. Okay, and then that is the for loop. And um, now this loop is going to run a couple of times. And after the for loop is done, we need to return some result. So let's simply go ahead and say, let's return b. Okay, we, we could also return temp. Okay, so maybe we can make this a bit clearer. Maybe let's rephrase, rephrase it into next number. And then we are simply going ahead and simply return the next number. 
However, note, um, we could also simply return B here, right? Because B and next number is basically the same after the last step in the for loop. So let's go ahead, define the function, and let's call the function Fibonacci loop for an index seven, okay? And I get back 21, and that is of course the wrong result. So what happened here? Well, in order to find out what goes wrong, my suggestion is to use a print function inside the Fibonacci loop function to get some intermediate output. So let's do that. So before the for loop, we will print out whatever a and b is, and we will end that with an empty on an empty line. And then inside the for loop, after we calculated the next number, what we are going to do is we are simply going ahead and we will print out whatever the next number, the next current number is. And we will also put that um, on one line. And now if I execute the function again, I see exactly what the problem is. I'm just looping one too many, okay? So how do I fix that? Well, I fix that by simply saying, instead of range of i, I simply say range of i minus one, okay? So in other words, we have to loop um, one less time. Now, if I go ahead and say Fibonacci loop uh, with seven argument EI set to seven will give me back 13, which is the same 13 I got back up here. Okay, that is how you um, can come up with a solution using a looping approach. And then of course, once you are done and you know your program is correct, then it makes sense to um, of course, get rid of the uh, print function calls here again. And now we see that this Fibonacci function um, also gives us the same result. Okay, so now let's do the experiment. So up here, we saw that the recursive version takes forever to calculate to calculate these numbers. So let's go ahead and also cal calculate Fibonacci for the same numbers that were slow above. So Fibonacci with index 24, very fast, but it was also fast above. Let's calculate Fibonacci of 36, which was already slow up here. It took four seconds to execute, to, to basically calculate the result. So if we do that here, it's basically in, in, uh, there in an instant. Also, if I go ahead and calculate the 999th Fibonacci number, so this is really the 1000th Fibonacci number because we start to count at zero. So this would be it, very fast. If I go back up to uh, this cell here, and if I call the normal, the normal Fibonacci function, the recursive version with the index 999, this now calculates forever, literally, okay? So um, without doing any calculation of how long uh, this algorithm may, or this uh, code here, this code cell may run, I can already guarantee you that this will take several years to, to finish, okay? So the only way to finish the cell is to really stop it um, here with the keyboard interrupt, okay? So what we see here is that um, using the looping approach, we can actually solve a problem very easily in a, in a very good time. So it's a very fast algorithm, but using the recursive approach up here, we cannot really solve the problem for big input. Okay, so that is a big problem. What, however, why do I like the Fibonacci uh, function in the recursive formulation? What I like here is that I, I would claim that this function is a lot more readable, okay? If I don't tell you what Fibonacci numbers are and I just show you this num this code here, this function, well, you could guess what it is. You can say, well, whatever Fibonacci of i is, it is the sum of its two predecessors of i minus one plus i minus two. And then we have a base case here, two base cases. Okay, so this code I would guess is easier to read and easier to come up with if you know what you're doing, of course, if you see the general, the general relationship, which is basically uh, the two predecessors com uh, added is the next number. The approach down here using the loop, we, all, we, we just saw as I did it, that it's not so easy to come up with um, how often do I need to loop? Well, you really have to think about how often do you need to loop. You really also need to understand how the A and B works here, okay? So um, yeah, so this is how, um, um, this, so my guess is that this solution is maybe a bit trickier to find. However, this solution has a big, a big advantage. It is faster, it is way faster. It is exponentially faster than the upper solution, okay? So for Fibonacci, this is the only approach that we can actually use in practice. However, that being said, in a future chapter, when we talk about the so-called dictionary data type, we will review this uh, version, the recursive version, and we will make this version fast. So maybe just to give you a quick idea of how we can do that, 
So in our actual graph here, when I calculate Fibonacci of five and I calculate Fibonacci four and just break this down and I go down this, uh, this path here, once I get, for example, to this Fibonacci of two here, I already know that I calculate the result. So if only I could store the result of this node here somewhere away in some book where I can basically simply write in all the, all the uh, temporary examples, uh, intermediate results that we already had, and then I could simply go ahead and look up the results from here. Okay, and this is what we will learn in a future chapter of how to do it. Um, but for now, we just have to live with the fact that the, recurs the recursive version is simply not efficient. So let's quickly go ahead and uh, finish up the looping version, make it look nice. So one thing that I just want to mention, if you write a for loop and the variable over which we loop, so x in this example, we don't need it. And we see that we don't need it is because we don't use x here. So know where we use x here. What you do in Python is, this is a convention, we simply replace it with a variable called underscore. So underscore has many different meanings in the Python world, but one meaning is that we don't use the variable, that we don't need it. But for syntactical reasons, we need it. So if I leave away the variable in a hole, then I will get a syntax error. So I, I must specify a variable here for syntactical reasons. And since I don't need the variable, I simply go ahead and specify it as um, an underscore. That's just a convention. And then also um, something that we can do, we can uh, get uh, rid of the next number variable here. So let's replace next return next number with simply return b because we know that b is equal to the next number in the last step. And now what we need to do is we need to update um, a and b simultaneously. So what we could do is we could do the following. We could write it on, on a line on its own. So we could do the following. I copy paste this down and I get rid of the first and the last line. And this line here, this one line, will now simultaneously go ahead. It will first evaluate the right-hand side. So the first part before the comma is a, will just be the B, and the, the second part will just be A plus B. And then the two results, so B, the value of B and the value of A plus B, will be stored into A and B. Okay, so this is basically how we can uh, simultaneously update variables. And let's check if everything works, it does. Okay, so now we have a nice version uh, of Fibonacci, a looping version, um, which basically solves the problem in an efficient way. Okay, so this is it for this video. Um, please review um, recursion if you uh, still have troubles uh, using it and also uh, take some time to understand why this function is not so good. So draw a diagram on your own, run this recursive version in Python Tutor, do whatever it takes uh, to understand um, what goes on and why this is not a good solution here. And then I will see you in the next uh, video.